All right. Okay. And the next one is what's this patient's diagnosis? And by that, what I mean is what's the abnormality, but give me a specific tissue diagnosis that's most likely. Not unique, but most likely. Okay? This one does not have a unique diagnosis, um, but why might we be doing this? What's a reasonable thought about what this is? And here's number four. What's the most likely diagnosis? And there is one that's most likely. Okay, and how about this one? So what's abnormal here? That is, if you delineate the extent of abnormalities, and what do you think is the underlying diagnosis? It's not unique, but there are a couple of diagnoses you could come up with. Okay, so bone scanning is much more pattern based, more like the rest of radiology than a lot of things I've talked about here. Bone scans are marker metabolic activity. Not in a very sophisticated way, but kind of in a simple way. That is, the scan shows increased uptake whenever there is increased bone turnover, new bone formation. It doesn't matter whether it's natlytic, net sclerotic. What does matter is that there's got to be bone turnover. And if there's no bone turnover, you're not going to see the finding. And the bone scan typically shows an abnormality, not because of the abnormality itself, but the response, the new bone formation of that process in sites. And most of the time that's not very specific, but sometimes it is. And if you have some correlative information or correlative imaging, oftentimes we can make a good diagnosis. Single photon bone scanning, I'm going to talk about PET at the end, uh, is done with a technetium labeled diphosphonate compound, MDP, HDP. The key understanding here is when you inject the tracer, the bone uptake is actually fairly quick. But most of the tracer never goes into the bones. It stays in the soft tissues and it's got to be excreted by the kidneys. And it therefore takes time for the soft tissue clearance and you've got to wait, therefore, to see bone scan images. Usually around three hours is the optimum time to see them. Uh, you can do spec imaging, you can do planar imaging. It's mostly still uh, standard to do planar imaging, although one could argue in this era why we're doing that. A variant of the three phase uh, is the three phase study. And the three phase study, it simply captures early information about blood flow and what's going on in bone and soft tissue. So the first phase is a dynamic sequence. Bolus injection, image for about a minute rapid sequence. That's simply telling us about blood flow. Nothing about the tracer uptake per se. Second phase, usually called a blood pool. It's really an ECF space distribution and then standard uh, imaging. Now, we often think of a three-phase study in the context of osteomyelitis, and you can certainly use it for that. But it's important to know that it is simply telling us about what's going on in soft tissues. It's not a specific diagnosis. You have abnormal uptake in all kinds of processes, infection, tumor trauma, and some other as well. The bone scan normally shows us uptake proportional to bone turnover. So that defines the normal distribution. And in patients who have poor renal function, particularly acutely, you have more soft tissue uptake. And that's why the bone scan in the elderly typically doesn't look so good. Now, in children who have very intense growth plate uptake, you also have very uh, intense bone uptake. But here we have a typical appearance of an adult and a teenager showing what that physiologic differences are. Let's talk about a couple of entities you can usually diagnose. Uh, metastatic disease, not necessarily if there's one lesion, but when it's extensive, it becomes virtually pathognomonic. And the key understanding here is that metastatic disease, most of the time, goes to the red marrow space. So it's axial skeleton distribution. Almost unheard of to have an initial diagnosis of an isolated metastatic lesion in the distal extremity. On the left, we have a patient with metastatic prostate cancer, classic distribution of that central red marrow space. On the right is a different patient, and you certainly do get abnormalities out into the extremities, but it's usually in patients who have fairly extensive disease, not as an isolated phenomenon. So keep that in mind, because it's important as we come down the road. Paget's disease usually presents as very intense uptake, starts at one end of the bone, moves contiguously, no skip lesions, typical zones of involvement. You may have deformity. Here's our first unknown. This is Paget's disease. You've got a shepherd's crook deformity of the right femur, a blade of grass on the left, characteristic zones of involvement. This is easy Paget's disease. Now, obviously, in real life, you could have another process superimposed, but in terms of the pattern recognition, this is Paget's disease. And here we have a patient with osteoporosis circumscripta. Note the intense uptake in the facial bones, the anterior skull, and that sharp zone of transition between the abnormal and the normal. There's that zone of transition. The abnormal here is lytic. 
And that's a reminder of the fact that it doesn't matter whether it's lytic or blastic. What matters is that there's bone turnover. That's what we're going to see. Reflex sympathetic dystrophy, often today called complex regional pain syndrome, usually post-traumatic, and shows bone scan abnormalities early on in all three phases of the bone scan, especially involving periarticular bone. This typically involves a distal extremity. Here we have a patient with profound osteopenia of the hand and wrist after forearm fractures, image reversal in the bone scan orientation. Note that the right hand diffusely hotter than the left and also some focality, particularly uh, in the carpus and metacarpals. And here are the delayed bone images. The whole hand is abnormal. It's kind of periarticular and diffuse abnormality, very classic appearance of RSD. Usually involves all of the rays, although sometimes can only involve a couple of them. In patients with RSD, the symptoms can go away, uh, excuse me, the symptoms can persist at a time when the bone scan findings have gone away. So you see this best early on in the course of the disease. Hypertrophic osteoarthropathy is almost always from pulmonary disease, and today it's almost always from lung cancer. So it presents as a diffuse uptake on a tram track appearance, and on the left is the second unknown I showed this uptake along the extremities, in this case the lower extremities, as well as the upper extremities, a little bit less common here. Very diffuse uh, uh, uptake along the extent of all the extremities is a classic appearance for osteoarthropathy, this patient's diagnosis is lung cancer. And that's not the only thing that gives this appearance, but that certainly is the most common. This is a very smooth zone of involvement. The patient on the right is a different patient, also with lung cancer. And notice in this case, it's a little lumpier, but it's still got that cortical peripheral surface lesion appearance. So when you see this, this is a classic appearance of hypertrophic arthropathy. Rib fractures. Rib fractures are very, very commonly seen on bone scan, usually because they're incidental findings, and so it's important to be able to identify them. A fracture in a bone scan looks like a fracture in a CT scan in the sense that it is a short segment transverse abnormality. They often involve multiple ribs and often are fairly contiguous. So if you see contiguous abnormalities just in a row that look like fractures, they probably are fractures. Here we have on the top and on the left multiple anterior rib fractures as well as a transverse sternal fracture. This is CPR-induced abnormalities. The commonest location for rib fractures is at the costochondral junction. And if you have one of those or two of those, you're virtually guaranteed that they are fractures. They're not, it could be metastatic lesions. Uh, on the lower right is a patient with involvement of contiguous ribs, but I hope I can convince you that's an entirely different looking pattern. Doesn't look like fractures in this case. This is chest wall involvement by, uh, chest wall involvement by a tumor. In this case, this was a chest wall sarcoma, but you see this very often in lung cancer with pleural invasion into the chest wall. So again, if they look like fractures and they're contiguous in a row, they almost certainly are fractures. So this takes us to our couple of principles about tumors. You typically cannot differentiate benign from malignant tumors on a bone scan, although there are a few exceptions. The uptake that we see in a tumor usually is not direct tumor uptake. Usually it's bone remodeling that's incited to that, but there are exceptions to that. If you've got an osteoid producing tumor, as we'll see, you will see the direct tumor uptake. Most tumors that we recognize are hot. A cold lesion would be one in which there is bone destruction. And in fact, if there's not much turnover, we're not gonna see it on the bone scan. Typically, you'll see nothing. If there's a large zone of destruction, you may actually see a cold lesion. Here's a very intense zone of uptake in this uh, lens shape, uh, classic appearance of an osteoid osteoma. This is an osteoid producing tumor, and it typically is very, very uh, bone scan intense. Contrast this one to this patient with fairly mild uptake in the left humerus, and it's a long segment of the humerus. Doesn't really look like a metastasis. Not that you can know for sure that it is, but this is actually a very typical example of an enchondroma, kind of mid-range uptake over a long segment, in this case in a fairly classic location. So you can certainly think about this. That would be a, a, a diagnosis that might be at the top of your list. And here is, for contrast again, what an osteosarcoma looks like. It's kind of an ugly looking lesion on a bone scan. Note that the bone scan uptake really mirrors the appearance in the plane radiograph here. You've got intense uptake in the tumor new bone formation, not just in the bone remodeling itself. And osteosarcoma really stands apart from other tumors because that osteoid producing intense uptake can be seen in soft tissue metastases. So we remember that in this case. This is a classic appearance of an osteosarcoma. Cold lesions. Cold lesions, as I mentioned, are, are scenarios in which the bone has been eroded and there's no real uptake. And these are hard to see, and most of them we probably miss. 
Unicameral cysts are cold. Most benign tumors are not that cold, although occasionally they can be. So if you see a cold lesion, usually it's malignancy. Plasma cytomas are notorious for being cold. Myeloma often presents as lesions that are too small to see. And we also talk about a couple of metastatic lesions, metastatic thyroid, renal cell. These sometimes present as cold lesions, but you can have others as well. And of course, there's other reasons why you may have decreased uptake. Here's a patient with back pain, and there's a cold lesion. If I take away the arrows, it's not as easy to see uh, as we might think. In this case, this was a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that's a reminder that although some tumors are, have a real propensity to give cold lesions, like plasma cytoma, others, like lung cancer, like breast cancer, can present as a cold lesion as a less typical manifestation. And it's important to realize that you're only going to see a cold lesion if it's a big zone of destruction. Otherwise, you're simply going to miss it on a bone scan. Now, the other important tumor principle I want to talk about is the flare phenomenon. If you have metastatic disease to bone and you treat it successfully, as the bone metastases heal, they become sclerotic on CT, and during that same time, you're going to see increased uptake transiently on the bone scan. So existing lesions get hotter and new lesions can appear. This is the so-called flare phenomenon. This happens all the time. If you do bone scans on protocol patients every six weeks, you'll see flare phenomenon happening all the time. We don't see it in practice that much because it's a transient phenomenon. It only lasts for about, about three months. And beyond that, it, it tends to go away. So if you're looking at a bone scan soon after the institution of new therapy that's effective, you have to be careful. You only notice a flare in retrospect because it goes away rather than progressing on to show more extensive metastatic disease. We see uptake on all kinds of trauma, fractures, stress-related injuries, all kinds of things. When you see a fracture on a bone scan, it's not the fracture line. Again, it's the remodeling around that line. It typically happens pretty early on, 24 hours or so, most of the time. And once a fracture develops in a bone scan, it tends to remain abnormal for a very long period of time. Non-weight-bearing bones can resolve more quickly than weight-bearing bones, but it's extraordinarily variable. Some rib fractures resolve in a couple of months. Some stay abnormal for life. Lower extremity uh, weight-bearing fractures may remain positive for life, although typically they fade away over time. Stress injuries. Well, there's a whole spectrum of stress-related injuries, and at one end of the spectrum is what we call a stress fracture. At the other end are stress-related remodeling. All of these are abnormal on bone scans, including on all portions of a three-phase study. So here is a coronal spec study of the back in a teenager. This is an unknown that I showed. This is a kid with back pain and spondylolysis. And I show this because a lot of people do uh, bone scan imaging for detection of spondylolysis. Obviously, there's other ways to see it as well, but we see characteristic uptake at the usual level uh, in the posterior elements. This is not a unique diagnosis. You could have severe, severe facet arthropathy. You could even have metastatic disease. In this setting of a normal teenager with back pain, it's a pretty good diagnosis. And here's our next unknown. This is a runner with leg pain. He's a stress fracture. Stress fractures are focal abnormalities along the cortical margin. And when you see these kinds of findings in the distal extremities, very unlikely it's anything other than stress-related injuries. These are not going to be metastatic lesions. Chances of that is virtually nil. Here's shin splint. Shin splint is a, a fairly stereotypic clinical presentation, and somebody who tells you they got shin splints and you may do a bone scan is going to look like this. Longitudinal uptake, not so focal, can be anterior or posterior. And I want to show you this slide to point out that in this leg, you're starting to have some coalescence. If this patient continued to run, at some point, we're going to call that a stress fracture. There's an arbitrary distinction in the spectrum of stress-related injuries, but we do see them on bone scans, including stress-related remodeling that's not symptomatic, for example, in the feet and ankles of runners. Uh, in infection, we often do three-phase bone scans to talk about osteomyelitis, and that's sometimes straightforward, sometimes it's not so straightforward, particularly if the underlying bone is abnormal. But here's our three-phase approach. In osteo, you get increased uptake on all three portions of the three-phase study, but note that you have the same thing in tumors and in fractures, and you have it in RSD, so it's not a specific indicator. It's simply telling you something about the physiology. In a simple scenario, it's easy. This is a kid who stepped on a nail and pain over the third metatarsal head. There's the hyperemia, there's the intense bone scan remodeling, normal plane film on the metatarsal. In this clinical setting, that's easy, that's osteomyelitis. In a different clinical setting with a different radiographic appearance, could be a fracture, could even be a tumor. So we keep that in mind.
That's the easy scenario. The complicated scenario is when the underlying bone is not normal. When you've already had a fracture or you've already had surgery and you're wondering about superimposed infection. In this case, the bone scan may be abnormal regardless of whether there's infection or not. So it's not a straightforward scenario. There are several ways to evaluate this, and I would say that in the modern era, we would typically do an MR to evaluate this. But within the nuclear pantheon, we're typically going to do a label white blood cell scan. And, and in our practice, we do this typically in patients who can't have an MR. Now, I've talked about FTG incessantly, about inflammatory uptake, and I will say the role of this is not fully determined. And again, as in other kinds of, uh, of infection inflammation imaging, some of that is because there isn't reimbursement for doing FTG studies in these patients. Uh, I'm going to talk in passing only about gallium imaging, and this is not something I recommend, but gallium, as I said, was introduced as a bone scanning agent. It's a pretty horrible one, but it does show uptake in all kinds of bone abnormalities. It turns out that if you have infection, sometimes you see gallium uptake that's more than you might have expected. But then that raises the question, what would you have expected? Well, in order to do that, you compare a gallium scan to an MDP study. And you look at the gallium, you look at the MDP, you say the gallium is more intense, more extensive, therefore it's probably infection. And, and this works sometimes, but most of the time it looks about the same and it's not really diagnostic. So we almost never use gallium imaging. Here's an example of a patient who had tibial plateau fractures, ongoing pain, bone scan abnormality, very poor quality imaging of the bone scan because of slow soft tissue clearance. But if you have almost no gallium uptake, you might argue that that's less than you would expect and therefore not infection. For the most part, this doesn't work. And in the nuclear world, we would do label white blood cell imaging. Now, this is easy because white cells, as, we, as we've already seen, do have some localization in bone marrow, but they don't specifically localize in fracture. So if you've got a lot of uptake, even around a fracture site or a surgical site, then probably that's infection. However, you have to be careful because bone marrow is always a potentially confusing scenario. And if you get a lot of bone marrow, it's hard to see infection. It is well known that white cell imaging is not sensitive for vertebral osteomyelitis, and it's typically not even worth doing it if that's what you're looking for. Maybe that's because of the marrow, I'm not sure. But here's how it can work as an example. Here we have a patient, status post uh, bilateral BKAs, uh, endoprosthesis, gross infection, soft tissue, grossly abnormal bone scan. No way you're gonna tell what's going on here. If we do a white cell scan and there's no uptake, then that's very useful. In this case, is the whole body scan just to remind us of a distribution, spleen, liver, and central red marrow space. Now, the problem here is when you have a fracture or a prosthesis, sometimes you get focal marrow expansion. And in that case, you can get a white cell uptake based simply upon the marrow space. So, anytime you've got an abnormality out in the extremities, you probably have to do a technesium sulfocolloid scan to compare it with. I've already gone through the distribution of that. If you've got white cell uptake and it simply matches the sulfur colloid, that's telling you that there's bone marrow there, so we're not going to worry about that too much. So a matching abnormality is fine. Discordant white cell uptake greater than what we would see with sulfur colloid is telling us this is a real finding, this isn't just bone marrow, and therefore probably is infection. Here's a reminder of the same slide you've already seen, red marrow space on a, on a sulfur colloid scan. And here we are back to a white cell scan. So we've got tip fib fractures here, we've got an endoprosthesis, patients having pain and fever is a question of infection. So here's the white cell scan for the general distribution, and there is an abnormality there. We have to do long images. These are 15-minute images with the Indian white cell scan. And we see there's a lot of uptake up here in the proximal tibia, which is not where the fracture was. So we might think that's probably infection. Here's the sulfur colloid. And in practice, these are done as, as a simultaneous dual acquisition. And we see that there's marrow expansion there. The endoprosthesis has caused that. So now we're saying, well, there's nothing that we don't expect. All right, so that's the way you use white cell imaging. Let me talk about a wastebasket of metabolic bone disease. And that, by that I mean not a specific entity, but anything that's characterized by increased bone turnover. When you have increased bone turnover, you tend to have increased uptake on a bone scan. And the commonest scenario here is renal osteodystrophy, but there certainly are many others that you can see. Here's a bone scan. We've got some spot views. It looks like a pretty good looking bone scan. And the only thing that really is of note here is we don't see any bladder activity and we don't see any kidneys. And there's a good reason for this. This is an anephric patient. So we've injected the tracer. None of it's been excreted. All of it is into the bones. There's no soft tissue background here. This is what we call a super scan. And a super scan simply shows increased bone uptake. 
Now, there's a problem here, because when you look at a bone scan, how do you know what the bone uptake is? There's no absolute marker. So the only thing we can look at is the internal clue of the bone to soft tissue ratio. And that's why if you don't see a lot of soft tissue activity, and that's why no renal activity can be a useful clue, that suggests to you that this is in fact increased turnover, a super scan. Be careful about the soft tissue in kids because kids have got great renal function and you may not see any renal uptake in them. Now a super scan can be caused by anything that causes increased bone turnover, metabolic disease or the last, like the last scan, or diffuse confluent metastatic disease. In metabolic disease, renal dystrophy or others, usually the scan looks very uniform, including in the extremities, and that's really the clue to what's going on. Metastatic disease will only give you a super scan in breast or prostate cancer that's completely confluent. And almost always there is some focal abnormality you can pick out, and that's how you know it's metastatic disease. Here's the fifth unknown I showed. Patient on the left is a patient with metastatic prostate cancer. And I asked, what's the extent of abnormality? And the answer is every bone in the body. Yes, there are focal abnormalities in the skull, in the spine, in the ribs, in the extremities, but what you might not have picked out is that everything here is abnormal. And that's the paradox of the super scan. The worse the disease gets, the harder it gets to pick out in a bone scan. And in fact, on the right is the same patient six months later. What's happened is the disease has gotten worse to the point where the central deposition is so intense that you have to window it separately to even see the extremities. But I want to point out that the spine has gotten more uniform rather than less. Once you've got a super scan for metastatic disease, it can be very hard to know whether it's getting better or whether it's getting worse, and it can be very hard to know what the extent of abnormality is. Here's breast cancer, and it looks abnormal, but every single bone in the body here is abnormal. And in this patient, as the disease gets worse, in this case, some areas look worse, some areas it's hard to tell. All right, so if you're ever confronted with a scan and you're wondering whether it's metastatic disease and you're not sure, the answer is very simple. Look at any x-ray. It doesn't even have to be a CT scan. It could be a KUB or a chest x-ray. Because again, the worse the disease on the bone scan, the harder it is to see, but the easier it is to see on an x-ray. You see uptake around prosthetic joints, hip replacements uh, for a year or two years. It's very variable, so it's hard to know whether there's a complication unless you have several data points. If you have loosening of, a, of the femoral component of a hip replacement, sometimes you get specific uptake at the tip the distal tip because of motion there. Uh, knee replacements are very difficult to evaluate because they can remain hot indefinitely. If you do a three-phase study and see a lot of hyperemia, that's a bad sign and it probably means there's a complication. Osteonecrosis is typically hot at the time of imaging because of the bone remodeling. I'm gonna show you an example of a cold one. Here's a typical steroid-induced osteonecrosis of the humeral head, very, very intense uptake. If you cannot deliver any tracer because of an avascular phenomenon, that's the setting in which would be cold. And these are old cases, we don't do pinholes of the hips anymore, but this shows you that if you can't deliver the tracer, then you can't have any uptake. But usually osteonecrosis is gonna be hot. Let me talk about PET bone imaging, F18 sodium fluoride, not FTG, but sodium fluoride which is not actually new. Sodium fluoride is the oldest currently available tracer. It was approved by the FDA back in 72 and it fell out of use because there weren't PET scanners to image it. But today it actually is back and you can get sodium fluoride from anyone who provides FDG. The problem with it is that Medicare won't pay for it and they very specifically won't pay for it. You can get coverage under NOPR, and you might get coverage for, from private insurers, but that's the issue that's holding back sodium fluoride imaging at the present time. It has a lot of advantages. You get twice as much uptake in bone as you do with MDP. You get much quicker clearance of soft tissue, which means you can do earlier imaging. You get high quality PET imaging, it's F18, and the determinants of uptake are essentially identical to MDP, so it looks like MDP. There's not a lot of retraining that's required, although you do see better lesion identification, so you have to re-threshold just a little bit because you see subtle findings. The advantage of soft tissue clearance that's so quick is you can do imaging at about an hour. Some people do it even earlier than that, but an hour is, is a good time to do it. So it's a very efficient process. What are the disadvantages? You know there are some. Reimbursement, that's one of the big ones. You gotta have a PET scanner available, that's another one. The dose is obviously more expensive, that's another one. And the radiation exposure per millicure is a lot worse, actually. So in an adult, to give the equivalent of a 20 millicurie dose, you have to give a five millicurie dose. 
most people have found that that is feasible to do, but it presses things a little bit. So the status of this right now is that people are doing it, they're talking about it, it's been used in a lot of different indications. Some of them uh, seem to be very, very good, but we're still kind of on the fringe of practice, and a lot of that, again, is because of reimbursement. Here's how we would do it. 60 minutes or so is plenty of time after injection to image. It's not clear at this point whether you need to do attenuation or correction of the images. Most of the ones we've done actually have been without attenuation correction and seem to be pretty good. That's still in evolution. But basically the message I want to give is everything about this is amazingly similar to MDP. So it's a terrific technique. Here is a MIP image from an F-18 study. This is a patient uh, with breast cancer. That's the typical degenerative disease in the spine. That's metastatic lesion in the thoracic spine. Here it is. This was missed on an MDP study. What's the comparison between these? Very hard to know. Uh, all I can say is it is a good technique. Here's another example of a spondylolysis. It gives you beautiful imaging, and I do believe that this is a technique who will be doing more and more as we move ahead. Last thing I want to say here is soft tissue uptake. If you're doing bone scanning, if you have a soft tissue process that shows ossification or calcification, you will see tracer uptake. And it's a couple of patterns that are good to know about. Metastatic disease to the liver, give you a focal uptake. Diffuse liver uptake, almost never seen in practice, but it's a, a, a very classic exam type question. You can get colloid formation in the preparation, and if you do that, you'll see diffuse liver uptake. You get uptake in all kinds of infarctions, splenic infarctions and in sickle cell, myocardial infarctions, cerebral infarctions, tumor leaking into the brain. If you have a, a diffuse chest uptake, oftentimes that's a malignant pleural effusion. If you have a lot of metastatic calcifications because of hypercalcemia. There's a triad of kidneys, lung, and stomach that I'll show you. We see diffuse uptake because of muscle inflammation, such as rhabdomyolysis. Quite often, focal uptake usually means myositis ossificans can be very, very intense. So here's a couple of examples. Here's a patient with metastatic disease, multifocal liver uptake. That's uptake in calcifications within the liver. Here's uh, myositis ossificans. It's 50 years old, believe it or not, still ongoing ossification. And here's that uh, case that I talked about, uh, metastatic calcification. Complex scenario, calcium of 15 here with some bone mats. But what I want to show is stomach, lung, and intense parenchymal uptake. That's the triad of metastatic calcification.